Good evening. Uh, seeing that there's a quorum in attendance, I'm calling the, what is today? The March 11th um, meeting of the Town Service and Outreach Committee to order at five-ish. Uh, Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. I am going to call on each committee member by name now to confirm that uh, we can hear each other. Um, Alyssa Brewer. Present. Uh, Darcy Dumont, present. Um, Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Thank you. And um, we've already been talking to everybody else. Um, those assisting the meeting will be monitoring committee member connections. If necessary, we'll pause the meeting until we are reconnected. Um, the Zoom meeting will be posted on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. So um, we still don't have any public, so we're not going to have public comment right now. Um, so moving on. We do not have any appointments. Is that correct, Paul? Um, and um, from my conversation with Paul, it looks like we are going to have um, reappointments coming up in the next two meetings. Is that correct, Paul? Um, not that soon. Uh, well, uh, when, when are they? Yeah, in the future, before. I'm not sure exactly which means we put those on. Okay. Yeah, but we're in that process. All right, so moving on to um, town manager report update and questions. Uh, just This is just a time when committee members can ask anything about the town manager report or if they have any questions. Um, anybody, I remember George, you had said that you might be asking about the Shelter. Um, George? Yeah, Paul, just a couple of quick questions. Um, I believe Mary Beth Golowitz, as you had said, is she's going to be sort of leading this working group? Yes. Um, who else is on it? We haven't put together um, people yet. Uh, so we're, we're working on the charge right now. Okay. So right now it's Mary Beth. Um, and it has met, well, I guess, since we, it really hasn't met formally yet. Oh, there's yeah there are no people right. <laughs> who are working on the charge and i'll share that out with you uh when um try at the next council meeting and from your statement paul at the at the council meeting i got the impression i may be mistaken but i think it was clear that that your focus as you said is broader or more expansive than just finding a uh, a permanent place for craig stores is that fair to say yeah so i think it's a two-pronged thing one is the short-term um immediate need of Craig stores and what's going to happen going forward with that. And um, and then the second is more of a comprehensive look at, at homelessness as well. Uh, we mm -hmm. sort of started that a while ago, um, but I think the idea is to bring the service providers and others into the room to start talking about how does this look for the town? How does this look for the region? Um, I know they're involved talking with the state in terms of where the state's commitment is going to be moving forward in this in this entire area. They, they meaning the Craig Stores people or, or just- No, uh, our staff. Your staff is? Yeah. And then finally, Paul, and I apologize to be so specific, but I, I, this has been asked of me a number of times now. Apparently there's some issue with a, a uh, what is it, basically a shower trailer that, um, and I'm just wondering if there's anything you can, any light you can shed on that, that it seems to be sort of lost in limbo somewhere. Um, maybe that's not true, but that's what I'm being told. And I just wondered if, if, if you can cast any light on this. It's apparently something that would be very useful to, to the folks at Craig's stores, but at the moment it's in the hands of the town and it's really, I'm just wondering where that stands. Sure. So um, we, um, when Craig stores moved to Unitarian Universalist Church, we rented space, the yoga studio that had showers. And we rented that for a fixed period of time and Craig Stores had the option to continue that relationship and they chose not to, which is their, mm -hmm. their choice. Um, 
in, in between that time, we did, we were able to, um, we've been purchased a shower trailer, but unfortunately mm -hmm. it's not uh, the only one we could get and short-term nose was not handicap accessible. Right. So we're either going to make that handicap accessible or um, develop something at Craig's doors. Uh, if the First Baptist Church will allow us to make, put a, a shower in there, we've looked at different options for that. And, and I know that, that those conversations were happened some time ago. I don't know where it stands right now. George, I can find out for you though. Right. I mean, it's been Jan since January, I think is basically the understanding I have. So it, uh, um, anyway, uh, so at the moment it's still in limbo. Right. All right. Okay. Thank and they do, they do have shower available at the survival. Well, they send, what they do is they send people one by one up to the, up to the uh, motel. Mm -hmm. um, it's not ideal, but it's something, but that's what they're doing at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, that's not another question, right, George? Okay. Um, so um, moving on to presentations, um, we have the, the further presentation regarding the two different stormwater bylaws. We had asked for decision, decision points for help from staff to look at where in the bylaws it would be helpful for us to look for our decision, our TSO decision. And they um, provided us with um, decision points on each of the bylaws today and um, an updated amended bylaws. So, um, Beth is going to lead us, I think. Are we going to go one by law at a time? Yeah, I thought we could start with the stormwater bylaw, and I was just going to share my screen and share um, the most recent edited version, and and we can look at that and and talk about the decision points. Also, then you know, just go through the bylaw. Any other questions that people have? About yeah, it makes ago. sense to me to look at your memo on the decision points first and then look at the bylaw. Does okay. that make sense to other people? Um, so that we, if, if that's, those are the larger decisions, we could look at that first and then we can look at the more, the, the detail of the bylaw if anybody has any. Alyssa had made some comments about, I think both of them, didn't you, Alyssa? Okay. So anyway, we'll get there. Go ahead, Beth. All right, so I'll share the decision document first for the stormwater bylaw, stormwater management bylaw. Can everybody see that? Uh, yes. Um. Yeah, so um, with the stormwater management bylaw, there's really two decision points. Um, the rest of the document is, is very standard from either, you know, templates that groups have put together or um, things that are required by the permit. Um, so the first decision point is really the, the size of the project that the permitting would apply to. So just to give you a little refresher, the stormwater management bylaw has to do with review of construction projects, new and redevelopment projects, um, specifically the, the drainage designs that are being um, presented as part of those projects. Um, and this bylaw gives the town the authority to establish a permitting system um, for those projects so to require applicants of construction projects to put together um, a package that they'd be submitting to the town um, with a, a permitting fee. And then the stormwater design would get reviewed by um, DPW engineers mostly. Um, so but the bylaw basically gives the town to set up that permitting system. And so one of the decisions is what size project are we going to require the stormwater permitting to go to. So that's section C of the bylaw. 
And what I did to for the decision points was I, I took a close look at neighboring towns bylaws um, just to see where what you know what they've got and just as a comparison. Um, so other towns nearby that, that have an acre or more so similar to us, the only projects that have to apply or anything that impacts an acre or more are Northampton, South Hadley, Long Meadow, East Long Meadow, and then towns, neighboring towns that follow something a little bit more restrictive. Um, all three of these towns, East Hampton, Hadley, and Chicopee, use a use the exact same list. Um, and their list starts off with uh, some to something that's similar to ours. They're saying construction activities and subdivisions that disturb greater than or equal to an acre um, would be required. But then they, they also add multifamily residential developments with four or more units. So if that kind of a project was proposed on a something that was three quarter acres, it would be required to get a permit or commercial industrial institutional structures on the same property under common owner ownership that have at least 5,000 square feet of gross, gross floor area or 10,000 square feet of impervious surface. So again, a new project that could be under an acre, but meets these thresholds would require a permit. Similar for redevelopment, redevelopment of commercial, industrial, institutional. Institutional, I think of as the university and the college colleges. Um, and then development or redevelopment involving multiple separate activities and discontinuous locations or on different schedules if the activities are part of a large common plan of development. And that was already in the by our, our first version of the bylaw. Um, so that list, like I said, three different towns use that same list. Belchertown gets a little bit more restrictive. Um, anything over 10,000 square feet of disturbance requires a permit in Belchertown. Um, and then I just added to how I, how I felt about it and TPW in general, Guilford too. Um, that the list that East, Ham East Ham Hampton, Hadley, and Chicopee use seems like a good answer because um, it sort of expands away from just an acre and it, and it includes commercial um, and industrial properties, but it doesn't include residential. So in terms of increasing the amount of DPW staff that would be needed, if, you know, if we get more restrictive, we're gonna need more staff time to review to review the actual designs and just for administration of the permits. Um, but this just seemed to be a a, a good a good answer. Um, so yeah, so we need to discuss that. Do we, do, have, people... do we have comments about that? Shall we decide this first? Um, comments, anyone? Beth is suggesting the compromise solution. A Andrew Steinberg. Yeah. Uh, are there any standards within either federal or state law regulation? Is the one acre built upon some minimum requirement and then anything more restrictive becomes a matter of local choice or is there not, no guidance? Yeah, the, the federal permit, the EPA permit is that you, you must permit things over an acre disturbance in over an acre um, but you but the municipalities can be more restrictive how many yeah. square feet in an acre 43,560 <laughs> one of those things you just get in your head and you can <laughs> um, Andy I'm sorry I interrupted you Nothing. Other comments? Um, am I, uh, should I assume that we all agree with Beth's suggestion? George? Just, just maybe just a bit more on why you think this is 
this sort of change is is a good idea? Is it um, it doesn't seem to increase, you're saying it doesn't really increase DPW staff time that much. So that seems like a plus. Um, and this is, is better for the environment. In other words, a, a closer, the closer we look at these sorts of things and the closer we review what people are doing, the better for uh, the environment overall is apparently the argument here. And um, to not do it would, um, you know, potentially involve some risk. Um, is that, I just get a clear sense of, of yeah. what behind this. Right, um, so there are a lot of lots within Amherst that can be developed that are under an acre. And, and I feel like uh, commercial and industrial and institutional structures really um, tend to have more impervious because they can have parking um, and they can have a large impact on what's ending up in our uh, storm drain system. Um, I think in my memo, I mentioned you know, the, the project on Spring Street, that is, I'm pretty, that's under an acre. That lot is definitely under an acre. So that, that's a um, large development project that will definitely have stormwater drainage coming off of it. It'll connect to our um, storm drain system. It'll have catch basins and whatnot. And yet it wouldn't be required to get a permit if we went with an acre. Um, in this case, I think it would, because I think it would have over 5,000 square feet of gross floor area. I'm, you know, I don't know exactly, but I just think these these requirements kind of hit the right types of projects that we might want to see reviewed. But but at the same time, it it, it has no impact on um, residential properties that may be over an acre. But again, those may be outside of town. And they may just not have as much of an impact on our stormwater system, on our on our MS4 system. Just a quick follow-up, Darcy. You um, you're mentioning Beth Institutional. Does do we actually have any say over uh, Amherst College and UMass, um, or no, in this in this particular area? Um. My understanding is usually we, you know, they can do whatever they want and there's nothing we can do about it, but maybe because this is a federal um, situation, I don't know. I'm just wondering because uh, most of the institutions are institutions that pretty much do what they want to do, at least UMass. Um, right. Well, yeah, UMass has its own MS4, so they actually do maintain their own stormwater system, but um, Amherst College and Hampshire College all feed into our especially Amherst College, because it's right downtown, um, feeds into our stormwater system. And they would be subject to our, our permitting process? Yeah. Good, thank yes, you. in terms of this, yes. Okay, thank you, George. Evan? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I like the option that's being proposed. Um, I think you called it a compromise option, which I'm not quite sure what you meant by that, but the... Um, the to follow what uh, Hadley and Chicopee do. Um, and my thought on that, actually, I was thinking about this earlier today when I was driving down Main Street and I was looking at the new project that's going up on Main Street. And I went home and I said, how, how big is that lot that they're building on? And it was 0.7 acres. And so my understanding is under what was proposed before, that project wouldn't necessarily have to go through this. But when I looked at what it's doing, there's there's a whole lot more impervious surface there now than there was before, certainly. So this seems to make more sense to me because it would capture a project like that. Um, I had, I had um, two, I think two questions. I'm trying to read my sloppy notes. Um, one is, I, I don't quite, to me, what matters is the um, increase in impervious surface. So I, I was kind of confused why it's, 5,000 square feet of gross floor area or 10,000 square feet of impervious surface. I'm, like, I don't necessarily know that I care about square foot area, but I do care about impervious surface. Unless, and this may answer the question, um, I was curious if impervious surface counted only ground level or if roof area counted as impervious surface. And if they were to say, put on a green roof, would that, would that reduce if roof area did count and they say put on a green roof, would that reduce the amount of impervious surface? I, I don't know if that made sense. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Sort of what, what, how do you define the impervious surface um, on the parcels? And, and that, that's a good 
a good point. I I'm sure if, if you put it, if you use an LID, like a green roof or something, that would um, that would decrease your um, your footprint. So your impervious would go down for that. Um, but the 10,000, again, this is a list that was in, that other towns are using. Um, if we feel like those amounts are, if, you know, it's up to, to us to decide um, what square footage we would, we would consider impactful. Um, right, I guess, I guess my question is more when we're talking about at least 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, is that including impervious surface on the roof or is that just considering ground level impervious surface? I think it includes the roof too. Yes. Okay, okay thank you. That was, that was my question. Alyssa? It's not so much a question as a comment. And so I appreciate that that Beth went back and, and looked at the different towns and then thought about how we compare to those towns because some of you have been in town government for a while as opposed to those who haven't might know that in the bad old days, we received many complaints about how unbusiness friendly we were so that we'd say, oh sure, you can build something but we will make it really complicated for you to do it. And from what I'm seeing in here this is, you know, making it more restrictive. It's making it apply to more properties. But when you consider that the uh, towns that we're looking at for similarities are East Hampton, Chicopee, and Hadley, those certainly are not considered business unfriendly places. It seems to be working there. And it, it's indicated in here that it is not a ton more work for staff, but yet it feels like the kind of thing they wanna be able to look at. So it seems to me like we're striking a good balance here and appropriately protecting the environment, not making it too, not having it just be one more thing that doesn't feel entirely necessary, but in fact does feel necessary because of protecting the environment. So it looks like we've threaded the needle pretty well here from what I can see. Is there, is there any more discussion about this? And do we have consensus? Um, do we, is there um, any objection to moving on and assuming that we have agreement that we will accept Beth's um, recommendation? Okay, ready? Uh, can you talk about the next one, Beth? Sure. All right, so the, the second, um, decision point is exemptions. So these are types of projects that would be exempt from applying for a permit. Um, and again, I uh, looked at what's required um, or sort of what's allowed under the federal permit and also what neighboring towns seem to be including. And, and there's, there's a real sort of standard list of ones that all towns are including. Um, this, these first five are, are standard. They're seen in, um, in all the towns that I looked at. Um, these first four are all, were all in the bylaw that you've seen before. This I added again, because it was in all the neighboring towns and actually looking closely at the federal permit, this is one of the things number five is, um, is allowed in the MS4 permit. So those are standard um, exemptions. And then what I've done here is just put in um, some of the other exemptions that we had in our bylaw and listed which towns have them and which towns don't. So it's really sort of a decision point for us whether or not we want to include these things or not. Um, my thoughts are, I think we definitely should include number one. Um, and number four was one, again, that, that is in all other towns uh, bylaws that I looked at. Two and three, in the end, I'm not even really sure uh, what projects they necessarily would apply to that much. Plus, they, they're not seen in, in a number of other towns. Uh, so both of them are seen in Hadley's, but not in um, some of these other towns. And I don't know if you want me to go through each exemption and kind of read them, or if you guys want to read through them yourselves. 
I, I, I don't think you need to. Oh, Alyssa, you have a comment? I guess not. Um, so I, I think that um, I personally would like to look more at the second set um, to understand what the additional ones. Um, George? I'm not sure what you mean, Darcy, the second set. Are you talking about the additional exemptions or I just didn't? Yes, additional, ex additional right. exemptions. So yeah, I, I don't see any reason to include three. Um, yeah, it doesn't all, I mean, it just seems pointless. Um, four, I think is, is, is you know, um, I also should be kept. I think that makes sense, right? Um, I think um, Beth had recommended one and four. Um, three, I definitely think should go out. Um, I don't know, I guess two is the only one where I think discussion might might be fruitful. Um, I would follow her guidance on one and four. Anybody have thoughts on two? Um, Evan. So I actually have a, a question um, that actually gets to applicability but might influence this. So the, and maybe I'm just getting confused here. So the language of the bylaw that we looked at last time um, said all new development and redevelopment, that makes sense. But then it also said land disturbance and any other activity disturbing, disturbing the drainage characteristics. The list that we just looked at that I think we sort of had a consensus, it says, construction activities and subdivisions disturbing greater than or equal to one acre. So my read of that is it's only disturbance to one acre or more that's associated with construction. Whereas what we looked at last time would be any land disturbance that might disturb the drainage characteristics. So it, it, it might, is that correct? Yeah, so I, I was, and I forgot to mention that. So, you know, this list is again, uh, what I saw in East Hampton, Hadley and Chicopee, that's their exact list. And, and I had thought the first thing, so A, where it's construction activities and subdivisions disturbing greater than or equal to one acre. I thought of replacing that with what we have in our bylaw, which reads what, what you just said, um, new development, redevelopment and land disturbance and any other activity disturbing drainage that's that's over one acre. So adding those to that first statement, sort of um, adding land disturbance and change in drainage characteristics to that first. Does, okay. that, does that cover what you're asking about? Well, so the, the root of that question actually relates to what George just asked, which is if, if we were keeping the language that's on the screen right now as is, we wouldn't even need to, because we wouldn't need to exempt maintenance of existing landscaping gardens because that wouldn't fall under C because it's not construction related. If we change the language as you just said, um, to include the language from what we looked at in January, land disturbance or any other activity that then potentially um, including Three, sorry, I'm clicking through a bunch of things, including three uh, or two maintenance of existing landscaping, we probably would want to exempt that because that could be land disturbance. That would be land disturbance, but it would be land disturbance through maintenance of existing landscaping. And so I guess to me, whether or not I think we need two depends on whether we're taking the language exactly as is written in the memo or the language that Beth, you just, you just said sort of combining January with this. Um, and so I guess that's my comment on whether I think this is necessary because I do think that we should exempt land disturbance that's disturbing land to maintain something that's already there, that's, it, that's in existence. Um, and of course my, my issue with this is the same one I had last time, which is I don't think it should just be associated with a single family. I don't think we should carve single family dwellings out and say if it's a single family dwelling, then it's fine. But if it's a 
converted dwelling or a two family or a three family, then it needs a permit. So that would, if we are going to keep this, I would like to just say associated with residential dwellings or I don't know, I don't know what the language would be, but um, I don't want it to be just single family. Okay. Um, Andy. So I, I think that the question that I had was about landscaping. Are there any types of landscaping that people do in their own gardens that in a family dwelling that may in fact affect what we um, are concerned about? Uh, patio bricking, you know, uh, paving over for patio purposes. Um, things like that. And um, another example is, and because I've seen a house that's done this, is uh, people get tired of mowing lawns and put um, rocks in instead so that they don't have to mow lawns. Um, and then when uh, they, I asked uh, one of the people in our uh, inspections department about that, and they said that their excuse was that it was landscaping. So I just was curious whether we have any experience that would cause us to be caused. What was the end of that sentence, Andy? Thank you. Anything got... that anything in the way of landscaping that would cause us to be cautious and uh, make sure that people are doing um, there's a danger that people are doing something that might affect runoff in a significant enough way. Beth, do you have an answer to that? Um, well, what I, what I always picture with this is, is somebody who, who redoes their whole yard. So, you know, part of um, the permitting has to do with looking at stormwater drainage design for redevelopment, new development, but it's also construction site erosion control fits into this. So, so if somebody's proposing a project, we want to see the stormwater system that they're designing for their building, but we also want to see um, erosion control for, for construction time. And the only thing when I think of landscaping and at, at, at this scale that we're talking about would be if somebody had said had a whole acre yard and they really hired a landscaping company to come in and, and redo the entire yard. So there's a point at which there's exposed soil, you know, they're, they're replanting a whole row of trees or something. And so then you would want to have, you would want to at least know that it's happening and have them have some kind of erosion control up because say there's a catch basins in the road right in front of their house. And now they have what's almost like kind of a, you know, construction project going on, but it's only landscaping, but it's because it's large scale. That's, that's all I could think of in this case. Um, so maybe we leave it in. I don't know how often that really happens, but. Thank you. Is there any way to define it? To define it? To define, define. what you just described. Um, as far as there are these larger landscaping projects that might create some concern. Um, have you seen anybody attempt to uh, legislatively define what that level of um, inter interference is? Well, I, you know, if we left it in as this and then, um, you know, Evan wants, we can add multi multi-family homes, um, but you left it as if it's over an acre, which is, which we can, we can do. And it says Hadley and South Hadley have less, less than an acre. So that exactly, Hadley and South Hadley say you're allowed to do any of these things as long as you're not over an acre, which is kind of the way the bylaw is written anyway. But to me, anything over an acre, you really are going to start to run into a potential for erosion problems during the landscaping event. Because um, it takes a long time for uh, grass to revegetate and whatnot. But if it's, if it's under an acre, maybe we're okay with it. Um, thank you, Beth. Alyssa? 
so I've got what <laughs> feels like three really random things here. So part of what's going on with that answer, I feel like we just got is goes back to the section in the January bylaw that says activities that affect less than an acre, but could adversely affect the municipal separate stormwater system or could reasonably be blah, 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 may also require permits subject to the discretion. So that you know leads us back to the question we had. Well, if you're not, if you think it doesn't apply, then you don't say anything to anybody. So how would the superintendent of public works, you know, off have their discretion if they don't know about the project, right? But it this covers, so there could be things that we just didn't know about unless we of course make the acreage smaller to begin with, but that's kind of a catch all in case it's found for some other reason, but it's not like every time you wanna move a, a wheelbarrow full of dirt on a process, you have to check on this. So I, I feel like we still have that, you know, that sort of catch all thing that says may require permit subject to discretion, but of course it will be difficult to know how that'll actually play out in reality. One of the other parts of this process that's just a little confusing is I super appreciate that Beth took what we said from the January bylaw and made changes to that and provided it to us days ahead of time, which was fantastic. But as we'd also asked, she wrote a separate memo, right, about our decision points. However, one thing that's slightly confusing about this is that some of the things that say that are under the additional section, right, because they're not required by the state law, they were already in the January version, right? And so you can't just look at the memo as being, okay, we're adding this to January because half of it's the same. It's that certain, she was trying to tease out what was required versus what other people are doing, but it doesn't necessarily say next to it. And that's already number X in our bylaw. So I just want to caution us that we're not like, the only things we're adding are true additions, not what's listed as additions on the memo because some of those are already there. <laughs> so, and then on the other note, because I know I found that pretty confusing the other day when I was trying to put this together, but it makes sense to me in terms of approach. It's just that we have to understand that what says additional is not all additional because half of it's already in our bylaw. The other thing is that when we talked about single family last time, the response was, it seemed more typical that when it wasn't a single family home that there was likely to be more impervious surface, right? Because it was, if it was two units, likelihood that there was additional parking than there would be at the average single family home and an impervious surface was again, the concern. And so while I am absolutely adamant that, you know, we're not privileging people with a single family home on X acreage and, and, disprivileging uh, people who live in a duplex. At the same time, I understand the concern that was raised then. So again, defining what it means or the size of it or the, the, the depth, so to speak of it, like Andy's just been talking about as well, is really the rub. And I think it was simple to say single family home because of that concept about impervious surface but it's not entirely accurate. I mean, some people have old driveways that are really big that have a lot of impervious surface for a single family home. And some duplexes don't, might just have gravel pads. So I think, you know, we're getting tied up in the single family part of it, but I think our bigger problem is how do we get at this, the underlying thing? And I guess a large part of that will be determined by whether or not we decide to go with a size that's smaller than an acre. Evan? So I guess I'm getting um, maybe too hung up on, on language here. If we're, if we're still talking about this too, um, which is, I understand Alyssa's point about there's probably more of a pervious surface and usually attached with multifamily, but this is really focused just on landscaping gardens and lawn areas, right? And so you know, that's why I, I don't want to necessarily distinguish between housing types. But to me, you know, the example that Beth gave about someone who maybe is doing re-landscaping their entire property, um, and maybe it's an acre property or an acre and a half property, and there's going to be a lot of exposed soil, to me, wouldn't even touch this exemption because that would be the new land disturbance and other activity disturbing the drainage characteristics 
um, that is, she said would be part of that list, right? And so to me, the keywords here are maintenance and existing. So like the example that was that, that Beth gave earlier to me wouldn't be considered maintenance of existing landscaping. That's re-landscaping, that's new landscaping, that's a whole new effort. I read this just as if you wanna do stuff to actually maintain what's already there, and they're going to be maintaining more than an acre of what's already there, because again, the acre is the, the triggering point under C, then you don't need to come, you don't need to come get a, a, a permit. So to me, this could just be maintenance of existing landscape and gardens or lawn areas um, associated with residential use or something like that. Um, and, and to me, I would want to exempt it because I think if it's, if it's, considered maintenance of something that's already there, you're not creating new gardens, creating new landscaping, then they shouldn't necessarily have to come and get a, a permit. Whereas if you are re-landscaping or creating something completely new, that would be triggered by C because that wouldn't be existing and it wouldn't be maintenance and it would be land disturbance of greater than an acre. So I actually do think that two would be wise to keep in just lopping off the single family dwelling at the end. Okay, yeah, no, that, that all makes sense. Yeah, if you look really at the maintenance and existing landscaping and, and yeah, we can we can certainly leave it in. That's that's fine. I, I see what you mean. If, if somebody almost has a farm type atmosphere and they do a lot of mowing and pr pruning of trees and whatnot, they certainly wouldn't want to come for a permit. Um, and yeah, they, leaving it in there makes it clear. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I mean, uh, Evan's comment may have uh, gotten to the solution that I was thinking about as being unnecessary, but um, you know, what it, we, we kind of have this weird thing going on in Amherst that single family de uh, dwellings are being converted to multi-tenant dwellings um, and the key factor is um, a dwelling unit where a rental uh, registration is required. And so I was wondering whether there's uh, any point in the bylaw where that might be a trigger to consider. Um, and I get back to the um, example that I was giving earlier uh, without saying what the address is during a public meeting, though, I, um, and that is uh, in the house that I was thinking of, or a large portion of the uh, front yard was uh, uh, all of the grass was dug up and they just covered it with uh, crushed stone, which is not any different, for, which makes it pretty much of an impervious surface. And uh, you know, I keep thinking about that situation and wondering whether that would have been something under the circumstances of the spy law that we would have wanted to consider. Well, so if we if we change, you know, our list of what applies, we have multifamily residential developments involving four or more units. Um, so. You could add in there in, uh, something along the lines in, um, and any um, dwelling for which a uh, rental registration is required by uh, town by, by town bylaw. I mean, this is really for construction of these, not necessarily just changing lawn into sort of a parking area. Because um, it sounds like the area you're talking about would be relatively, you know, definitely not close to an acre. Correct. Um, and you'd have to look at it to make a determination as a professional whether there's enough of a change that it might affect drainage. I'm not competent to make that um, judgment. Right. 
Um, I don't know if we have an answer on that. <laughs> um, Alyssa? Yeah, again, with some hesitance to not be too specific about which property. There was a rather large grassy area in front of a rather large home that had um, for a long time, just basically a big tree in the middle of it. And then that tree was removed, but then later a line of hedges was installed. That property may actually be an acre. Would we expect someone to know that if they suddenly just decided to put hedges on their very large property where it had just been plain grass before that they should do this? I'm just, again, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to not be too picky about individual things, but I wouldn't want one neighbor to say, oh, I felt like I had to get a permit and the next neighbor to say, no, actually you don't need it for that. So remind us of how that would work for that single family homeowner, right? We're not even talking about multiple places. That's on a very large lot that for a long time, for whatever reason has just been grass. And now they've suddenly decided to do various other things. How would they know that planting bushes would be considered similar to say they suddenly wanted to terrace it with stone walls and such, right? Because like the second thing they'd probably think to ask, but the first thing would they think to ask and is this a problem? Is there any way of, I just want to steer yeah. people in the right direction. Yeah, um, well, you know, letting people know whether or not to abide by all of our permitting and um, bylaws is always kind of kind of tricky in general. I mean, certainly when I was the wetlands administrator, time after time, the reason I found about found out about projects was because neighbors reporting on neighbors. Um, you know, I think I said when these come out, the, the biggest group that I think we want to let know about um, these bylaws are, are developers um, and contractors and, and landscapers. That's a group that I always felt like and I tried as the wetlands administrator to, to send them flyers and keep them in the loop about what they shouldn't be doing because in the end, if they don't do it and someone reports them, they're the ones that get the enforcement. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that, that those are those are the groups I think that we would want to let know that this, this is a new um, permitting pathway to go through. But, but like I said, the wetlands stuff's been around for 25 years and there's still plenty of projects that get started across town and that people start and oops, we don't have a permit and oops, we should have gotten one. Um, so it happens, but yeah, education about it would be the, is gonna be the best way. We'll have to do that. Okay, Evan? Just to just to respond to Alyssa, because and to make sure I'm clear on this, the example that she's giving, it it's not the size of the property; it's the amount of the land disturbance. So those hedges wouldn't wouldn't trigger this because the property you're describing is 1.2 acres. I looked it up, and so it, it they would have to do complete landscaping hedges on one acre of that property before it triggers the bylaw. So the hedges they put in don't count, even though the property itself is over one acre, it's how much the, the amount of land disturbed has to be one acre. Right. So, so I guess the homeowners would just need to know that if they're disturbing more than one acre of land on their property, then they need to do this. But the, the hedges that were planted at this address that we won't say, um, wouldn't trigger this because there was a very small portion of the property. Okay, um, I think we should try to um, move on a little bit. Um, the up above Beth, it looks in this second, the second, um, second issue, uh, it looks like we are, are in agreement to keep the standard exemptions, um, that we uh, agree that Beth is going to change A above in, in the first, wait a minute, oh. um, all, all the way up to the, the first issue, so that she's right going to change A, the, the definition, to uh, make it um, 
as it was in the the January version. Um, can you read that again, Beth? Sure. Um, shall apply to new development and redevelopment, land disturbance, and any other activity disturbing the drainage characteristics of one acre or more of land, or as a common plan of development or construction that will disturb one acre or more of land. Okay, are we okay with her going back to that definition that was in the previous version? Um, as part of this list um, that we uh, previously agreed on. <laughs> um, okay, and then as far as if you scroll down again, Beth, to the additional exceptions. Uh, it sounded to me like we were in agreement that we should keep all of these additional exemptions, but that we should change number two to instead of saying single family dwelling, say what? What should we say, Evan? I was just gonna say associated with residential use. Um, but I also think, I, I think we said that we weren't gonna keep three. To be an exemption? Yeah, I think we said we were going to get rid of that. We didn't feel like it was necessary. I, or at least George said that. Yeah, George is actually having second thoughts. Um, <laughs> maybe I want to speak up um, and correct him. But it does seem like if I just want to put in a fence that's not altering existing terrain or drainage patterns, why should I need to get a permit, right? So if I'm reading this correctly, um, and I misread it, I think, the first time, this basically exempts that. So it says you can put your fence up, you don't have to get a permit. And that seems sensible to me. So I guess I would be saying three should come out. Am I right. understanding that now correctly or not? No. I'm not. <laughs> That's okay. It's a long day. So somebody explain. Alyssa, why why is he not? Because he's trying what we're doing is we're adding that as an exemption. We're putting it in as an exemption to make it clear. If you're making a fence that will not alter terrain or drainage patterns, you are. You can specifically point to this and say, okay, I'm exempt from this. If you don't have that in there, like the version we got in January didn't have, maybe didn't have it in there, I can't remember. Um, actually it was in the January version too. If you don't have it in there, if you take it out as an exemption, right. then it lends the question of, well, what about a fence? Right. So you just go ahead and address it in the exemptions and say a fence that won't alter terrain or drainage is fine. Thus, meaning other fences would need to be evaluated. I just think it's great when we can be specific with people and we are actually saying to people who are constructing a fence that they allege will not alter existing terrain or drainage patterns therefore are not subject to this permitting process as opposed to somebody saying after the fact, hey, you build a fence, don't you think maybe it's covered by that thing? And since it doesn't say in here about fences, then every time it's a judgment call. Thank you, Alyssa. Yes, I, I read it right the first time, then I reread it and then I got confused. So I'm sorry. And so, but we're in agreement that we should keep all of these additional exemptions, all of them, all four. Okay, so is there any more discussion on these decision points? Alyssa, is your hand still up? I wasn't sure how we decided to end Evan's sentence about um, maintenance of existing. We were chopping off, so maintenance of existing landscaping gardens or lawn areas, and does it just end there? Instead of saying associated with a single family dwelling or trying to come up with some other calculation? Are we gonna say associated with residential use? That is what I said, but I'd actually also be fine ending it after lawn areas. Because to me, it doesn't really, if it's, a, if it's maintenance of something that's existing, it doesn't really matter what the use of the property is to me. Okay. 
Okay, uh, so shall we flip to the to the bylaw itself and just see if we have any um, other comments? Sure. Let me take a note. Um, Beth, could you remind us how much, how, uh, what's the deadline for our finishing with these bylaws? Um, June 30th. Uh, it has to be approved by um, council by June 30th this year. Okay. Yeah, at this rate, we might not get, the, get through both of them in this meeting, but um, we shall see. Because we, we, we do need to also talk about our outreach for uh, Pomeroy. And if there's, if I may, after it, after we're done with it, it goes to GOL. Right, right. So yeah, all takes time. Can everybody see that? You make it a little larger. Uh, Good. Okay. All right, so here's the stormwater management bylaw as it, with all the track changes. Um, so this, the definitions and whatnot, we didn't, we were just changing some of the footers and the headers. And then we get to section C that we were just, just talking about, which is where you're deciding on the size of the projects that would need permitting. And I go down a little so I can see. Um, and I, you know, I, I think the discussion we just had is gonna rewrite that section. Um, reword requested by GOL. Mm, I don't remember what that was. I think you wanted this, the one comment on this from the January meeting was to split it up a little bit and um, reword this paragraph. And now we've sort of made kind of a significant change to what it's going to look like. Um, so that rearrangement will happen. Um, and then Alyssa had, had split up that paragraph a bit and rewrote re it in her comment here. And again, that's going to all change. Um, I'm assuming that I'll probably put together a new draft bylaw that you'll look at one more time. <laughs> Alyssa, is that was that all keeping the same language, just reorganizing? That was the attempt, yes. And so you know how just like the exemption section has all the little numbered paragraphs. I wanted the applicability section to similarly be easier to follow that way instead of kind of going back and forth within a paragraph. And so at like Beth said, we now have a longer list that's going to be under applicability anyway. So it kind of forces the issue into more of a numeric system. And I think that that'll just be easier for people to work with and that'll be fine. So appreciate the redraft. Close, how we close. Yeah. Um, so then D is the exemptions that we were um, just talking about and those will will also change to the decision that we just made. Um, the structure of that should look exactly the same. Let's see what's this comment. single family. So we, we just addressed that. Um, administration. Uh, I, so I, I removed that um, because it, as we brought up that it would make the bylaw out of date. It's town manager shall develop um, within one year regulations. Um, so just we will establish the regulations. We don't need to have a time frame because it does make make for date 
situations. Um, so these, this is all the administrative administration section. We had a comment on. All right, we discussed this during during the meeting that if 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 a decision is appealable, it isn't final. Right. And I, I still feel like you see that kind of a statement in in bylaws and, and sort of what it's saying is um, the superintendent's decision is final. If you want to go beyond that, then you go to the uh, appeal. The appeal, um, you'd have to appeal, which section G7 has a whole discussion of how you appeal and you're, you'd be appealing to the town manager. So it's a whole, it's a, it's a process that you would go to if you aren't happy with the superintendent's final decision. But I still think that makes sense that the superintendent, whatever he says is final. If you don't like it, you have to go, then you go to the appeal process. But that's just how I look at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that makes sense. Okay. But um, <laughs> Because it's not it's not final if it's appealable. Uh, is there any reason why we can't just um, take that sentence out? Sure, we can change well, you, it. You you could say that the decision of the public, a superintendent of public works is appealable and, and just take out the final. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh... By, uh, laws are usually constructed of this nature is that uh, there's a timeline given for how long someone has to appeal and it becomes final at the conclusion of that period. Um, and uh, if it is appealed, then you have to have the second question as to whether the uh, matters the decision of the superintendent is stayed until the conclusion of the appeal. But, uh, you know, that um, that's normally how these kinds of provisions then get phrased in order to kind of thread between what Darcy, uh, I think was concerned about, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, Darcy, and where we were. Are people okay with this language? Alyssa? So can we just, I'm sorry, did we agree to just get rid of that sentence because it, it so it, it could just read six, appeals of action, further relief of a decision. Like we just don't even need that sentence. The decision of the part, like it just needs to go away because above this, it said the superintendent of public works could take these actions. And then it says appeals of action for the relief of a decision. And then it goes in, and then it has the time frames and such that Andy talked about, although it doesn't talk about a stay in the appeals section. But I, I understand why it's confusing to people. I understand why it's not confusing <laughs> to that. But I think maybe if we just take the sentence out, it just solves the problem. And it just says further, it says appeals of action period, further relief. Everybody okay with that? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, no comments there. And then it, it, it in this section, it said uh, enforcing person. And we just, at the last meeting, said, should that be superintendent of public works? So I made that change. Hope everybody's all right with that. And Alyssa, that's it. You have another comment, Alyssa? Um, OK, well, that was quick. That was quicker than I thought it was going to be. Um, so I, I guess we should. Um, for each of these, um, have you come back with a, a new clean copy that, that we can you know, make a motion on? 
I, even though I know that Lynn has this on the agenda for the next town council meeting to vote on. Um, I don't think we're quite ready if we if we haven't seen the final version. Um, and of course, we need to see the other bylaw. So um, I'm, I'm going to I'm I'm hoping that that we can get that done by 6.30 because Andy, we have a hard stop at seven because of the JCPC meeting. Um, and um, so I would like to at the very, you know, latest move to the, to talking about the outreach by 6.30 because we definitely need to talk about that. Alyssa? So question about what we just did is given GOL's timing and given town council's timing, does it make sense that we say we're enough done with it that it can go to GOL without having to sit, bring Beth back to go through line by line with us again, what we just did? I mean, obviously something could get lost in translation, but she was super diligent the last time. And I'm just wondering if in terms of moving it along, that at least the bylaw part, the stormwater part could go on to GOL because we're done with it once those changes are made. Well, are we um, are we confident enough to to um, move to recommend it now? This one? I am, <laughs> but if uh, George says no, I don't. I think it's still too messy. Then I don't want to stick him with it. But I I thought she fixed everything last time, so he uh, might yeah, very well be able to fix it and get it to George before our next TSO meeting, right? So I I am um, I am fine with doing that. Um, are we, are, are we recommending to the council? Um, okay, so uh, I don't remember the title of it. Does anybody want to make that <laughs> motion? <laughs> Where is the title that we're looking at? Uh, Stormwater Management Bylaw. Okay, so I move, we recommend um, that the town council approve the penalties for violation of stormwater management bylaw as amended by the TSO on this date. It, it, you, you'd want to adopt the stormwater management bylaw because we're not just approving the penalties, we're adopting the bylaw recommend the town council adopt the stormwater management bylaw um although yeah although we know okay that's fine um did you get that emily i got it just so, okay just so it says as amended by the this committee on uh, today's date the 11th of march right um, so, uh, second? I'll second. Alyssa, you have a comment? Just that I think it's ready enough based on our experience thus far working with Beth, where it's clear that, you know, we've worked with other groups in the past that, you know, have been like, oh, I forgot that whole page of notes you, might, you wanted me to include. That didn't happen here. So I'm confident with moving it along, even if we're not quite, even if we don't get through the IDDE tonight, which hopefully we will. Okay, so we're voting. Alyssa? Aye. Darcy, yes. Evan? Aye. George? Yes. Andy? Yes. Okay, so we'll, we will, um, we'll have at least one to send over to GOO. Um, and uh, there, let's so look at the you, points yeah, on, the, on the other, storm water bylaw, which there's only one, I think. There we go. All right, so this is the decision point document for the, the IDDE bylaw. Um, and in comparing that to other towns, though, the language is, is just identical across the state <laughs> for these bylaws. There's templates out there and towns tend to to copy each other. Um, so the only decision point that I could really see is um, requiring remediation. So for mediation, it would be in a situation where somebody um, either discharged 
into one of our catch basins somehow discharged into our stormwater system or, or had been illegally connected to our system and had been polluting. And then we basically found the outfall where that was going and there was significant um, damage to the outfall, to the soils around the outfall. And so remediation would be something that we are requiring of, of this of this resident or this business. And uh, other towns that had it in their bylaws were this list of uh, this list of seven towns. So most towns tend to have it. I did notice that it wasn't in the East Long Meadow um, bylaw. You know, it, it also just came up because in terms of what's sort of required by the EPA MS4 permit is so much of the IDD bylaw, everything is, is required by the permit anyway, but remediation is one part that, that's not required by the permit, it's, uh, by the MS4 permit itself. Um, so that's the one point. I don't know how people feel about that. Sounds like you're recommending it, Beth. Yeah, I guess I would recommend we leave, leave it in, yeah. And does anybody have any issue with that, George? So how specific, do, I mean, is it just remediation and it's left, that's it? Or um, is it, do we have some specific, um, you know, criteria or whatever you have to do? Or is remediation just mean you've got to make it bet, you've got to make it right, and we decide what that is? Um, well, we can look at the, the language in the bylaw. If Should we look at that? Yeah, please. Just for a moment, please. Sure. Is this the right bylaw? I think it is. <laughs> uh, Andy, do you have a comment? Yeah, I have actually a question for Beth. Uh, if there is pollution because somebody has violated this bylaw, um, is the town responsible under federal or state law to remedy the violation and to um, clean clean up the whatever needs to be cleaned up as a result. Yeah, if it's if it's an impact to a stream, river, wetland, pond, it it would fall under the Wetlands Protection Act. So we could we could be violating that kind of an impact can be violating the Wetlands Protection Act. So then remediation could be being required under that, which then if we didn't pass it on to the source, to a resident, then the town could be the one paying the bill to clean it up. Yeah, this was the kind of thing that the Finance Committee was feeling that needed to come to discussion through the TSO, but we wanted to make sure that the TSO thought through that kind of issue. So thank you, that's why I brought that up. We're now in the other committee. Uh, so this is the section that talks about it. Um, Superintendent of Public Works may issue a written order to enforce the provisions of this bylaw or regulations, which may include but not be limited to requirements to eliminate illicit connections or discharges to the MS4, perform monitoring, analysis, and reporting, cease and desist unlawful discharges, practices, or operations, remediate contamination in connection therewith. And then this, this whole section sort of gets into the details about the remediation. Um, and like I said, that this language is, is the exact language that is in a lot of these other towns and is in the templates. Um, if the superintendent of public works determines that abatement or remediation of contamination is required, the order shall set forth a deadline um, by which such um, abatement or remediation must be completed should further advise the violator or property owner should perform an meeting with specified deadlines, um, 30 days. So this gets pretty specific with, with deadlines for remediation. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then do, there's an appeal. Is there anyone who has, um, since this is the same language as all those other towns use, um, are 
are we in general agreement that we should include the remediation section? Okay. Um, shall we uh, go back to the beginning and run through what we can do in the next like 10 minutes? Uh, because then we are going to stop regardless. <laughs> yes. Um, um, so I'll just go, you know, this is the, the definition section. We had no changes. We changed the header and footer again in the, with the definitions. Um, and we got to applicability. Let me look at Right, so this used to say um, the bylaw shall apply to all flows entering the municipally, municipally owned storm drainage system and less explicitly exempted by the Department of Public Works. And the question was, well, what's the exemption criteria? So I think at our last meeting, we talked about just taking that out. Bylaw shall apply to all flows entering the municipal, municipally owned storm drainage system. Um, okay. And then again, the regulations, town manager may um, develop and periodically amend regulations, rules, written guidance, and that used to have a shall develop within one year. And similar to the other bylaw, we, we took out that time limit because it's just restrictive. <laughs> um, so I took out one year because we probably won't, for the IDDE bylaw, we don't necessarily need regulations anyway, but it's, it's, I felt like it was good to have this in there in case down the road we decide we do. Um, right, this ultimate responsibility, why is it necessary? Does it limit liability? And this is something again that is in all other towns bylaws that I looked at IDD bylaws. Um, and I just thought that maybe an attorney, if we still question it, an attorney could weigh in on what that exactly is all about. <laughs> that sounds like a DOL issue. Yeah, I just, DOL just needs to know if you want us to do that. Um, this goes to attorney for review. It would be helpful if there were specific places um, we, could, we could highlight it um, or not. Um, do you want us to highlight it? It's a question. It would seem to me that um, it, that is a question that we have. Yeah, I have anyway. Um, yeah. I'm just looking for guidance from the committee. Um, I'm not sure I have it, but that's not necessarily, you know, so if, if, if there's consensus, then yes, we will highlight it when it goes to the attorney for review. I don't hear anyone else. <laughs> um, so uh, that doesn't sound I like- I agree with you, Darcy. Oh, you, you do? do? Okay. Okay. But, so this uh, is, again, just remind me, this is section- um, e. Where, where Section E. e. Section e. e. Okay. Um, Ultimate right. responsibility. Thank you. Okay. Um, section F, prohibited activities. Um, under number two, illicit connections, the construction, use, maintenance, or continued existence of illicit connections to the MS4 system is prohibited. This prohibition expressly includes without limitation illicit connections made in the past, regardless of whether the connection was permissible under law or practices of applicable or prevailing at the time of connection. There was the sentence after that, a person is considered to be in violation of the bylaw if the person connects to a line conveying sewage to the MS4 or water course or allows such a connection to continue. Um, and I think the question came up of sort of why, why is sewage explicitly sort of called out there? And I agree that, um, you know, that was again, something that 
originally was in there. I probably found it and saw it if it was from a temple or something. And I agree that it doesn't, I, I, I would recommend that it, it doesn't need to be included. Okay. All right. And then exemptions. Waterline flushing. So let's see. Oh, yep. Um, people thought notification was a little was vague and needed um, a little more specific. So we had a telephone or email and 24 hours to make that a little bit more specific and did the same down here where it says notification. Okay. What happened here? Suspension of storm and any person discharging to the MS4 in violation of this bylaw may have their MS4 access terminated if such termination would abate or reduce an illicit discharge. Superintendent of Public Works. Little issue. I think I just got rid of the word department and added added superintendent of and added issue a written order in compliance with section K4 of this bylaw notifying again, just clarifying um, how somebody would be issued some kind of a of an order. Mm -hmm. Just clarifying that. That looks like a non-substantive change. Yeah. And adding in, uh, so I changed petition to the Public Works Department for a reconsideration with appeal the order in accordance with section K-5 of this bylaw. I think we talked about, I think that was, we, that was something we talked about and people wanted that to, to go through the, the, the appeal process. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, I think that just uh, um, in prior discussion, there had been some feeling that uh, there's been back and forth on what the regulations require about whether um, some wells in houses were able to um, go into the wastewater and the answer now is um, clearly no. And uh, so that if there are any homes that had those connections when there was a vestige of the lack of clarity that now exists, that they would be required to come into compliance. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that it's important to know that there might be some homes out there um, unknown number, um, I think it's probably the right thing that we have to do. Yeah, I, I, um, I think the way that will happen is as we find contamination in outfalls, we'll be trying to find out where it comes from. Because like you said, there's a number of houses out there that have um, sump pumps and other things already connected to our storm drain system. Is that, that's what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. So I think it's gonna be more of a, as we find contamination using this bylaw as giving us authority to investigate. And if we, if we find people that connections are causing a problem, then we would do something if there's if there's people who have a connection, but they're not causing a problem <laughs> at this point, you know, if it's an old old connection, then we probably won't find out about it. Um, okay, let's see what else we got here. All right. Uh, what are we under here? We're under enforcement. Right. I think I think this change was already in the what you saw at the last meeting, um, 
somehow this is the having this in here had got moved around and I, I put it back in here because this is this is definitely something that that we need to have. Um, so, you know, it's a big part of the bylaw to, to give the town the authority to investigate. Okay, looked at this section already. Yep, we looked at that already. Okay, now. Move the section up. Yeah, uh, we had looked at compensatory action and, and wondered what somebody had wondered about moving it. And I, I just suggested that we could add it to the remediation that's right above, mm -hmm. um, sort of adding compensatory action as an option for remediation. Everybody good with that? Um, okay, I think we just made it through the second bylaw. You did. Huh. Um, shall we, um, any further comments about it? Um, shall we move to recommend could you, could you scroll up to the title? Um, yeah. yeah, motion to uh, recommend that the town council adopt um, the illicit discharge detection and elimination bylaw as amended on this date, 311-21 by TSO. Second. Any, uh, any further discussion? Okay, Alyssa. Aye. Darcy, yes. Evan? Aye. George? Yes. Andy? Yes. Okay, thanks so much, Beth. That was great. Sure, thank you. May I make, may I make a request that she uh, send this to me um, as chair of GOL so that um, we won't be getting to it at our next meeting. I'm afraid it's already full up, but I will get to it as soon as we possibly can. Great. Great. Thank you for all your work on that, Beth. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. See you, oh. Beth. Um, okay. Paul. So we're. Paul, Paul has his hand up. Oh, uh, sorry. Sorry, Paul. Quick question for George. Are you going to want Beth at your GOL meeting as well? Um, that's a good question, Paul. Let me let me think about that. Probably would make sense. Um, but let me get back to you. All right, so we're moving on to the Mass Works Pomeroy Village Project Outreach. And so um, ho hopefully we're going to hear from Paul about what his plans are, what he's already done, and um, also talk a little bit about the format of our meetings coming up. So, Paul? Yes, thank you. So I think the memo summarizes where what what we uh, where we are. We he's received an email today noting that the Engage Amherst site is up and running. Uh, ben Brieger and Brianna Sunred worked on that. So thanks to Ben who's here tonight. Um, I think the you know the sort of outline is the same that you've seen before. I think where we would benefit from is it's a TSO meeting on the 25th and the 27th, and it would be helpful to know how you would like to structure that meeting, um, and. Chris will be sort of the lead on our outreach efforts on this. So, um, uh, so I guess that's you know we're, we're, our goal of the meeting is to hear from individuals, and we're actually starting to hear it from hear from folks already on the uh, Engage Yammer site. Um, what their concerns are, what they'd like to see change, what what they like about the intersection, what are the broader improvements they'd like to have us incorporate into this project. Um, I guess I'll look to Chris if there's anything you want to add to this, Chris. Um, well, I just wanted to say that we've already begun the outreach. Um, we had a meeting with the D Disability Access Advisory Committee the other day, and they um, made comments and suggestions, and they plan to um, solidify those at their next meeting. And we're going to be um, talking to the planning board about this on Wednesday, the 17th of March. Um, and. Um, Maureen Pollock plans to speak with the design review board late in March. So we've made um, some progress already. And I think Guilford's bringing us to the transportation advisory committee next Thursday. 
So um, we already have, um, you know, things in the works. And um, yeah, I, I guess I would like to know from um, from this group, from TSO, um, what kind of a presentation, if any, you would like from staff um, on the 25th and the 27th, or would you just like to open it up to um, public comment? I got, I got a little bit of an impression last time we met that you would maybe not want um, a presentation by staff, but I just wanted to have that clarified. Um, I, I just have a couple questions about the outreach. Uh, is the, the um, and everybody else can ask questions too, obviously. Um, what I know in the, uh, the initial outreach presentation, there was also, uh, you know, um, expressions that you were going to do outreach to the local businesses and the local residents, you know, neighborhood associations and such. Is that happening or, and how, if it is, how would TSO get the results of that? Well, Dave Zomek and I are working on that. Um, we haven't actually made outreach to um, those individuals yet, but we have a kind of a, a working list. So um, we're, we're, we are definitely, you know, moving in that direction, but we haven't yet made the contact. Yeah, those. And I, and I think that the, the members, the people they talk to would be encouraged to write to the council or come to one of the public meetings or engage in a different way. Um, just, this is mostly about education and letting them know the venues that they can, where they can participate on this project. I just feel like the, the business, the, uh, the businesses that are actually right on the intersection, um, you know, they seem like they're major stakeholders in this. Mm -hmm. uh, George? I want to go back to the, I guess, the initial question is what do we as TSO want from staff? Um, do we want a, pre, a formal presentation? Um, it is, I guess, part of the role here is education. Are we confident enough if, if we were on our own with maybe a slide uh, deck at our fingertips that we could present things or are we just going to open it up and have a discussion, just let people speak? Um, this is a question for my colleagues because I'm not sure myself. My, my inclination is to, it's always nice to have someone in the room who actually knows something about what is happening. Um, and I'm usually not that person, but um, maybe collectively we would be. Um, so how do we want to answer that question? Do we need staff? Um, and uh, if so, yeah, what do we want? All right. Um, Alyssa? So I feel like I'm a little behind in this process in that I I think I've said now twice at our TSO meetings that I believed that Darcy would be talking to Paul and through Paul staff about what these meetings would look like. And it seems like that still hasn't happened. And so how can we react to a plan that doesn't exist yet? So I appreciate that it's been added to Engage Amherst. That's terrific. And that's part of the outreach, just like the list of things that you mentioned, Darcy, is is part of the outreach that staff is doing because we had that conversation before. I think it's important that that outreach has been completed before those meetings. As Paul just said, when people are doing out, when staff's doing outreach, they can say, write to your town counselors, go to these meetings, because it does not make sense to me to sit at one of these two forums and say, we intend to talk to local businesses, but we haven't talked to them yet, even though we knew weeks ago we wanted to do that. So I want to be able to assure people we already talked to businesses. Now we might need to continue the conversation or, or take you know a particular piece of it, but that needs to happen before these meetings on the 25th and the 27th. So say, I don't know about design review board, I'll leave that aside. But when it comes to things like you say, Darcy, the business owners, so I'm feeling like one, the staff outreach has to be completed before the 25th and 27th, not after and not reported at the meeting as, oh yeah, we'll do that someday soon. And then secondly, in terms of the actual format of the evening, like I said, we keep going around about this and I thought you guys were gonna talk about what that format might look like. And then you would tell us tonight and we'd say, excellent idea or 
did you think about this other thing? But instead we're like having another brainstorming session and I don't know why we're in that position. And I'm not sure how to move forward because we talked before, you know, is there a length of presentation just as Chris just brought up and George saying, having somebody in the room who knows the answers. We can't just say, hey, everybody, we got a grant. What's your ideas about this intersection? I mean, we could be there for two days. So like somebody has to shape what the reality is without, as we talked about at previous meetings as well, including town council, without saying this is about a signalized intersection or about a roundabout, right? It's about the underlying issues that will cause us to choose one of those two things. So how do we get people to share those things in a productive way that doesn't just become a bunch of people came to line up to complain and say they want to in signalized intersection and the other half want a roundabout and nobody's thought about the engaging part of it, other than the people that have already been reached out to by staff. So I don't want to just a giant random brainstorming session, and I don't want a lecture. And I thought we made that clear a couple of meetings ago. So what does that leave us with? <laughs> what are our other choices? I would, I would just um, answer that um, well, briefly. In, Paul and I did talk about it, and I think we agreed that we would have a short very, you know, pretty short presentation by staff, um, just, you know, to give an overview of what the possibilities are, and then definitely have staff there to be able to respond to questions um, and to focus a lot on the questions that Paul had brought up, which were basically, you know, questions about what people see as problems with the intersection, what's good, what's bad, and so on, but also allowing them to ask other basic questions, you know, like you say this is going to be good for economic development of the area. Can you help us understand how either one of these options could do that or whatever, you know? Um, so, because I, I think that people are interested in that, you know, they're interested in, I'm interested in it. I'm interested in finding out what are the advantages of the different options or in general, you know, like what, what's the best case scenario here. Um, and so we don't want to restrict people's questions, um, but we also don't want them going way off into all sorts of details that are going to be uh, things that the consultants are going to be working on after it even leaves TSO. Um, so uh, if people have ideas about how to, you know, uh, confine the questions a little bit, that probably would be a good idea. Um, Andy? Yeah, I think that what I would uh, like to see is the presentation be brief, but to try and focus on those matters that uh, require some level of technical knowledge and that uh, may not be evident to most of the uh, people who are participating, like uh, what are the design features of the two types of intersections and why do engineers uh, recommend one over the other and in what circumstances, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. Um, Chris, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I wanted to say a couple of things. Am I unmuted? Yeah. So I, I got the impression, the strong impression from Melissa the last time we met that she did not want a presentation. So that's why I'm trying to figure out exactly what kind of a presentation you do want. I understand that you don't want a half hour talking about, you know, listening to me talking about Pomeroy intersection, but um, if you could give me some guidelines about exactly what you would like in the presentation, that would be helpful. The other thing is that the planning department staff has been stretched to the limit lately. We have not had time to do a lot of outreach. We certainly plan to do outreach, but I don't think it's going to be before the 25th or the 27th of March. It's just not possible. With all the other things we have on our plate, including this um, new 
development that's coming into downtown Amherst. So, um, you know, we just have to be reasonable about how we're, we're doing this outreach. I have envisioned it as a kind of rolling process where we're interviewing individuals and finding out what they think. We're meeting with um, boards and committees and finding out what they think. We're going to have these public forums and find out what they think. And then at the end, we'll put it all together. But I didn't really um, think that there were deadlines um, where we had to do this before we do this. I think it's kind of a more organic um, way of doing things if we you know, just proceed the way we are right now and don't feel like we need to absolutely get those interviews all done before the meetings. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Alyssa? So that, that's helpful, Chris, because I mean, we don't have to agree, but I need to know practically what makes sense, right? Totally what makes sense. And so um, given where we are and given where we are with resources, the one, the other thing I want to follow up with there on, obviously, you know, the question that you asked first is if Alyssa doesn't want me to talk for a long time, then what is it we're going to talk about? And that's what I was trying to get at when I was saying, you know, we're not trying to get people to line up on either side of an, uh, you know, signalized or this. We're trying to get a kind of the underlying, but I don't know how to ask that question because I'm not a professional planner and I don't know the exact scope of what we're trying to accomplish versus what Darcy's saying someday later consultants will work on. The other part of this is that I think I must have misheard something about the meeting with the various groups and the, I, I made sense to me up until the point where it talked about meeting with boards and committees, doing the outreach, it's at TSO at one point, and then I didn't hear it said that Lynn would pull it all together because Lynn wouldn't pull it all together. This is a town project that staff would pull all that information together, which I think reflects back to what Darcy was saying back at the beginning is to, if we haven't like, for example, since we won't have the outreach done before the 25th and the 27th, we won't know ourselves, nor will we be able to tell the people in the audience, we talked to 10 businesses and these are the major concerns they had. We won't be able to say that at that forum. So they won't be able to be informed by that. And we won't be informed by that until some later report comes out closer to the time of our decision-making. So I think that's part of what the information flow question is here too, is are we just assuming that staff is gonna to talk to all these groups and we'll never hear another word about it until a lengthy report is written about all those meetings, because like you said, realistically, it can't happen in terms of just like informal reporting out on the 25th and 27th. So what's our end goal here? It's some big omnibus report of all the outreach that then is part of the package for when town council actually votes on it, because TSO, I would think, would wanna be able to respond to, oh, if those are all the things you heard, and these are the things that are in the package that's being presented, maybe we're not ready to recommend this to the town council yet. So I'm just trying to figure out where our points are for TSO or if we're just like sending it away for a while and then it comes back to us. We may get more information after the public forum. Um, I mean, we, you know, we're gonna have a, a couple of meetings after the public forum before we have to get our recommendation to the town council and, you know, there's only so much that staff can do. <laughs> so, you know, they're going to all these meetings and, uh, you know, uh, so we may get some information after our public forum and that's just the way it is. Um, so, George? Our recommendation to the council from TSO, however, is strictly about either a signalized intersection or roundabout and that's it, right? That's all, we don't say anything else. I mean, we obviously these discussions and everything that's happening will, will feed into that decision. But in the end, the recommendation is for one, is either for A or B. Right. So uh, on that topic, you know, like to answer your question, Chris, about the presentation, um, my suggestion is to have just a really basic presentation showing the two options. Um, and uh, a very brief overview of what are the pros and cons, I guess, of the two options. Because um, people do not know about roundabouts. They, they don't, you know, they don't know what the pros are um, and they, 
they just have, they need, like Andy was saying earlier, they just need more information from people who have technical expertise. Um, and there probably will be people that, that are from TAC that come to our public forum that will speak to that too, that do, that have expertise also. But, um, you know, we saw that at our recent District 5 meeting, people don't have an understanding about roundabouts much at all. So they, they, they need to hear that. And there may be questions, you know, that come from the public that you, you'll be able to answer um, in those areas too. Ben? Great, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so I um, just wanted to, I've been holding a few thoughts in my head and I'm trying to remember them, but um, so I'll be there on the, on the Saturday meeting and I'm, I can help uh, run the meeting as well. Um, I just wanted to say a few things. One is um, in terms of like the report that, you know, collecting information, the Engage Amherst page is a really powerful uh, new tool for public engagement and kudos to Paul and Brianna for getting that set up. And uh, and you can, right now, I mean, there's a tool on there for you know people to just write their ideas and that's an easy way to collect information. Um, we're, I think we have planned to develop a survey, just a brief survey for the Pomeroy Village intersection. And I hopefully we get that launched before the um, public meetings, but that will be a great tool to just be able to um, collect people's thoughts, you know, concerns, their vision for the intersection. And, you know, that's not just limited, it's limited to, or sorry, it, it's open to obviously business owners, residents, people who commute through, people who bike through. So it's really, we're going to, you know, blast it out, out there. And I think what's really nice about a survey, the way we can structure it is, you know, you can ask a series of questions like, do you primarily ride the bus? Do you bike? Do you walk? Do you drive through here? And then, you know, what are your main concerns about this intersection? And then, you know, do you live around here? Do you work around here? And then you can begin to kind of figure out that like, oh, the, you know, people who, you know, live around here are most concerned about, you know, the lack of crosswalks or the people who bus, temp, uh, you know, generally, are more concerned about you know the speed of traffic while they're waiting for the bus or something like that. So I think developing that survey will be a really powerful tool for um, understanding the different user groups and what their main concerns are. And I think for for me, like I, we were talking about, like do we want to say on the survey just straight like roundabout versus intersection? And I don't think we want to like make it that polarized just yet but at this point just like figure out what are people's main concerns because it could be that you know it, it's not necessarily roundabout versus intersection it's you know if you do a roundabout that's fine but at least like put a flashing beacon there for to stop traffic if for at a crosswalk or something so I think there's ways to like lend b the benefits and issues with both types of intersections um, so I just wanted to give you a, you know, let you know that that's what we're working on with the Engage Amherst page. Um, and then I also wanted to mention too, you know, I think doing this all remotely and over Zoom is challenging for public engagement and just recognizing that, um, you know, in my experience doing like planning studios and outreach projects in the past, it's really nice, you know, getting everyone together in a room, having maps to look at, pictures, images, and people um just sharing stories and like getting you know getting together in small groups like that that would be the ideal <laughs> scenario for this type of meeting um and I think you know with zoom yes we can technically do like breakout groups and stuff like that I don't I don't know if we necessarily want to do that um but I think what I was just going to say is um you know we can definitely give a brief presentation but I think maybe having a map like up on the screen or pictures um, of the intersection might be a good visual tool for people as they're talking so that they can, you know, not just talk in the abstract, but reference like specific points that they see on the screen. Um, so I, you know, we have 
at this point a number of base maps for the village center. Um, so I think, you know, it might be awkward because we're at, you know not it's we're not seeing each other's screen. You're looking at the map, but um, it might be a good visual tool, or maybe it can be pulled up and put down as as needed or something. But that's something we can do for the outreach sessions. That sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chris. So I wanted to say that I, I was imagining that we would have multiple conversations with TSO as we gather information, as we talk to neighbors and we talk to business people and we meet with boards and committees and presumably after our public forums and we would come back to you and talk to you about what we have learned rather than just you know, as I think George suggested, submitting a report, we don't, eventually we'll submit a report, but I think it would be more useful to have, um, you know, a series of ongoing conversations before you have to finally make your choice and your recommendation to town council. And, and I think that's what um, Guilford Mooring is um, hoping that will occur also, because he's talked to us a lot about, you know, rather than jumping to a conclusion or saying this or that up front, why don't we find out what people like about this place or what they really don't like or, you know, how they use it. And so, you know, just gathering information, I think, is important. And then that will help you to reach your conclusion about which thing you want, this or that. So I, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, and I think that people who attend these forums are, are you know, they're going to base their opinions to some extent on data that you can provide. Um, so to the extent that, that, you know, we can make sure that we have data, you know, like safety data about the intersection um, and usage, um, I think, you know, our, you know, our residents are, uh, you know, likely to ask questions about that is my guess um, for, in order for them to help, to help shape their opinions. So um, anyway, other, th other thoughts? Um, Paul and I can talk more about this. We're going to, actually, I can't remember when our next meeting is, Wednesday. Um, anyway, we'll finalize the format <laughs> before, before the 25th. Um, any other thoughts about what we should do, Alyssa? You'll have to finalize the format before then, since that'll be the first night you're doing it. So yeah, um, so I think that the two of the the polarizing things I really appreciated the things Chris and Ben have been saying about not just jumping to a conclusion. Paul's been talking about this too, and you know the underlying things that are then going to drive us one direction or another. And you mentioned data, Darcy, but I think one of the things that's hard for people to quantify, but yet they have very strong opinions on it, perhaps not necessarily based on the same data or history that our staff would have it on. And so thinking about two questions in particular, one is when people say it must be a signalized in intersection or it must be a roundabout. I think Ben brought up a great point about it could be a roundabout, but it could also have a flasher, right? It doesn't have to be one particular kind of roundabout. It doesn't have to be either Atkins or the one north of campus. And those are your only two choices. Like there are modifications that can be made to address the concerns people have, because otherwise what I hear already in the community is people saying the only kind of intersection that's actually accessible to people with disabilities is a signalized intersection. And that's not factually true, okay? There are lots of preferences, but there are also lots of modifications that can be made. You will also hear people say, having a roundabout or having a signalized intersection will make a difference in how many businesses locate in that little area because a lot of people continually talk about we're already seeing it on Engage Amherst. We wish we had more of a cafe there. We wish we had this. We wish we had the other kind of business. And we do wish all those things. But there are people who already assume that having one or the other kind of intersection will produce that, you know, A plus B equals C. And it isn't like that. So anything you can do to sort of give people a, a bigger way to frame their heads around this. So it's not just, if I want there to be more business, that means I have to pick this option because that's not what we're trying to get at. What we're trying to get at is if you are of the opinion, as I believe many people are, we want more little businesses there. What makes that a pedestrian, bicycle, et cetera, friendly intersection 
given we want businesses there versus the state's attitude, which was always run people through there as fast as you can. Okay. So thanks for thinking about that. Cause I think that that'll help people get out of their mindset. Right. Um, okay. So I think that we have um, exhausted this topic for today and that's 656. Um, so <laughs> Um, do you all feel comfortable with us? I mean, we probably don't feel that comfortable, but um, we're, we're just forging ahead anyway. Um, so, <laughs> um, we, we will have more discussions about it between Paul and me, I'm assuming before um, next Thursday or two weeks from third today. Um, so we are gonna move on then. And, and look at our minutes for the last two meetings. They're both amended slightly just for, you know, like minor, very, very minor corrections, non-substantive. People have a chance to look at them. Yes, I did. Look at them Thank you, Emily. Yes, I looked at them and I'm fine with them. I'm fine with them too. Okay, anybody want to move? Let's do move both. where? Move it, both of them at the same time. <laughs> Sorry, is it a lame choke? Um, I move we accept uh, both minutes. If you have the dates, Darcy, I don't have them in front of me. Um, February 11th and 25th. Thank, thank you. you very much. As amended. Second. Um, okay, we'll call vote. Uh, I'm starting with you every time, Melissa. Sorry. Okay, I abstain. <laughs> okay, Darcy. Yes, uh, Evan. Aye. George. Yes. Andy. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Uh, any announcements? Uh, our upcoming agenda. Um, we uh, dispensed with the stormwater bylaws, so we don't have to do them at the next meeting. Where I'm just talking about the first hour of the next meeting, and um, we are, I, I think. We agreed, Paul, that we could have the um, presentation from Guilford about the, the uh, town-wide residential parking during the first hour. Um, I already heard part one of it at the TAC meeting and it was very interesting. Um, okay, and so the second hour we'll have our forum and um, their surveillance technology people are coming back at the second meeting in June um, because um, they, Paul is going to put together some kind of annual report type thing um, and he needs that much time to do it. And they're looking into, uh, you know, getting a report from Cambridge about how their surveillance bylaw has been going. Um, other than that, uh, um, do we have a public here? Um, any other questions about our upcoming agendas? Okay, um, do we have any, oh, George, sorry. Just quickly for my own sake, um, when we meet again, the second half of the meeting will be this public forum. Yes. And at this point in time, I guess the answer, we're just gonna do our best. We're gonna wing it. There'll be a short presentation and then we'll just open up the floor to questions and we'll take, we'll listen and we'll take notes. And that's that sounds okay to me, but that's what I, I take it is what we're gonna do. We're going to, well, we're gonna have staff there that can yes, respond. They'll make a short presentation and then we'll open up the floor for comments by the public. And we will not, will we engage them? Yes, the staff will. Yes, uh, staff they will answer questions. Okay, right. Yeah, we, I mean, 
I don't think we know enough. Right. Staff will probably answer the questions, yes. Yeah. We'll not be talking that much, but staff will be. Um, and uh, yeah, so does that- my question, should we be talking at all? I guess is my question in a public forum. Should we, the members of this committee, be speaking other than hello and goodbye? Yeah, no, I don't think we're giving our opinions in this, uh, this forum. Um, I think I'm going to be facilitating it, but um, but I'm assuming that I'll just direct questions to staff. Um, so um, yeah, and uh, do we have any public comment? We have a person. We have an attendee. If you would like to make a public comment. You need to raise your hand. Oh, she disappeared. She or he. Um, and we have no items not anticipated. Um, unless any of you have any. Um, okay, so we're done. And it's 702. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thank I declare adjourned. Thank you, Paul.